time that perfectly. All right, I'm going to here. That way you can actually see. Okay, ready? And you're up. Magwanani. Magwanani. Mingalaba. Mingalaba. Wakiwe. Wakiwe. Mbote. Mbote. Jambo. Jambo. Nalama. Nalama. Olege. Olege. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Bonjour. Bonjour. Zafshanha. Zafshanha. Kajatani. Kajatani. Teriyati. Teriyati. Mauri. Mauri. Perfect. Thank you. Oh, and good morning, Chuck. Good morning. I'll, I'll handle that one. Good morning, folks. It is good to be with you this morning on this slightly overcast. Is this the first Sunday of fall? Or was that last week? This is the first one? Last week was? Yeah. Welcome to fall. It is good to be with you today. A couple of announcements as we begin our service together. You'll see in your order of service, um, we are continuing to collect school supplies. Today is the last day. Um, Mission Committee is going to have a different collection each month. Um, and so if you're able, I think next month is going to be dish soap for minnow, mothers need of others. So if you're out grocery shopping this week and you stumble across some dishwashing detergent, uh, the liquid dishwashing detergent, I encourage you to bring that in with you. Scholarship forms. We're a little bit late this year, but better late than never. Um, we are collecting scholarship form applications. They are available at the Welcome Center. They're for anybody who is going into post-secondary education of whatever sort, okay? And uh, the deadline for this, though, is October 7th. One week. One week. So, if you're uh, interested, the information is at the Welcome Center. You're welcome to ask uh, Dawn or Bill. They'll be more than happy to answer whatever questions you might have. And again, one week. So you can fill them in, drop them off at the church. You can um, scan them and email them in. Whatever you need to do, all that information is printed here. We certainly encourage you to apply if you are pursuing any form of post-secondary education. The uh, Aging Joyfully and Gracefully group is meeting on Monday, October 7th at 1 p.m. And I know Susan would love to see you there. And the 150th anniversary um, display in the cabinet there is of our student ministers from over many, many years. And we certainly encourage you to spend some time taking a look at that. Tom, come on up, and then uh, Anika, do you want to do an announcement? Okay, so you come on up too. I gotta say, this is a very interesting vase, and as I'm looking at it, it looks like a very large chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> And it also looks like it's staring at me from there. But I won't eat it. Today, we are having another one of our uh, sessions on getting to know you better. I'll tell you, we have some very interesting people in this congregation. And Katam Lamai Soros will be the one who will be, we will be learning about I spent two hours with her because her stories are just unbelievable. So I uh, hope that all of you will make a point to, to come back and, and just uh, enjoy the, her sharing her life story with us. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I just wanted to make an announcement that Ukulele Club starts next week. Um, so if you're open to trying ukulele or you would like your kids to try ukulele, feel free to stop by. At, well, just stay for an extra 20 minutes and we'll figure it out. But thank you. Yeah, come to Ukulele Club. It'll be great. <laughs> 
Thank, thank you, Anika. And uh, just want to let you know, I mentioned last week that if you're interested in making a contribution towards the Ukulele Club, um, they're $65 a piece. If you want to make any contribution towards that, please speak to Val. And uh, so far, we've already had contributions uh, to cover four of them, and we would love to be able to cover all of them for the kids. Not like we're going to return them if we don't get the funds in. That being said, it's a great way to be able to help to support this ministry. And one last thing, upcoming in the community, which is today, Sofia Martinez, who is our alto choral scholar and is going to wave right now. Hey, okay, we'll be singing in the Eastman Chorale this afternoon at 3.30 at Kilmore Hall at the Eastman School of Music. The concert is free and they'll be singing works by Brahm and other names I cannot say. Not that I can't say them, I just literally can't say them, but they're in there and I certainly encourage you if you're interested to attend, it should be a wonderful concert. Am I missing any other announcements? Please join with me then for our responsive call to worship this morning. We gather to pray. We gather to praise. May our prayers extend beyond ourselves. May our praise rise to the heavens. May our lives be full of love. May our prayers be reflections of peace. Let us pray together. Faithful God, inspire us to be faithful to one another. Open our hearts to meet the needs in our midst and in the wider world. Open our minds to see the beauty and the gift of your creation. Open our mouths to sing your blessings, joyfully and gratefully. Open our lives to welcome the stranger, to seek the lost, and to create peace in a troubled world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us sing together our opening hymn, All Who Hunger, Gather Gladly, and the words are printed in your order of service. Let's sing together.
Today we're going to be reading from Psalms 104, and we're going to use the Peace Table, which is the translation that we use with the kids. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. God, you are very great. You are light like a majestic coat. The heavens are like a tent. The clouds are your chariot. You send water rushing down into valleys, giving drink to every animal. The birds sing by the streams. You make grass grow for animals to eat. The earth brings forth food for people. Birds build their nests in the trees that you made. The stork has a home in the fir tree. The mountains are for the wild goats. The rabbits hide safely among the rocks. You made the sun, the moon, and the darkness. Animals come creeping out at night. The lions roar, needing food from you. People go out until work, until evening. How wonderful are your works, O Lord. The earth is full of your creatures. Everything on earth looks to you for food. When you open your hand, all creatures are filled with good things. When you take away their breath, they return to dust. May your glory last forever. I will sing to you my whole life. As long as I live, I will praise you. You are very great. Praise the Lord. backstory and preparing for our children's message today. I saw that everything has its place in God's creation. God mentioned the tents that the animals go under, the nests that the birds build, and the water and the rivers that rush by us. And he mentions the lions and mentions us too, going to work every day to be able to do whatever he's called us to do. And so we are a part of God's plan for creation. And this is why we have Earth Day, where we look after the Earth or intend to be intentional about making sure that we take care of the world that we live in. And this picturesque description shows us that nature is a part of us as well. And so as we continue to look after the Earth, the Earth also kind of looks after us. In some places, they build houses out of clay or out of mud, out of straw. And though I doubt that any of us here live in houses out of clay or straw, this is a really nice picture of what the world we live in does for us and how it helps us. We rely on it to give us these supplies for our houses. And even the things that we use today to build our houses here, like our power tools and whatever instruments we use, they somehow come from the earth. And so God has designed the earth in a way that we're able to use it as a resource but he's also designed us as a resource for the earth so we can continue to get back to it. And I think the Bible describes the world so vividly to encourage us so that we can look at the world through a lens of wonder and see how particular and meticulous God was in creating the earth. And reading this, I wondered how did God come up with the concept of light? How did he know how our bodies would take it in and how our eyes would see it and how it would make everything so much clearer? He knew the birds would need a home, but how did he decide which one to get them? How did he let them come up with nests and use sticks and mud to build these homes for them and for their, for their little baby birds? And I think that people who do build their houses out of clay and mud got their ideas from maybe the birds and seeing how they made their nests. Maybe that was God's intention all along, was giving us these animals so that we could look at them and observe them peacefully, and then also use them as encouragement for our lives. I think, also, that sometimes it's easy for us to see ourselves as separate from God's creation, because now we do other things. Now we don't ride in horses much, but we ride in cars, and there's, we have luxury in our lifestyles. And when we do think of ourselves separate as God, God's creation, what causes this? What in our minds goes astray from whatever God has originally intended? Because the truth is that we are God's creation and that we've always been, and that he made us from dust, as it says here in Psalms 104, and that we'll also eventually return to dust. So we can be more intentional about caring for God's creation. 
And God's creation isn't just the earth, and it isn't just the trees, and it isn't just the water, and it isn't just the animals. We are God's creation too. And that's why we have to look after ourselves and after each other. And once we remember that we're part of God's creation, it'll make it easier for us to rely on him. Because we'll see here how he's taking care of historics, and how he's made the grass grow for the animals, and how he's planted seeds so that the trees can sprout up and we can have oxygen. And so if we're able to see and look at these animals and plants and the oceans and rivers, then we'll be able to also see God and look at how he's taking care of us. Because if he can take care of the grass that's here today and God tomorrow, then he can take care of us as well, his children who he loves. So let's make an effort this week to notice nature and how God has taken time to organize it in such a beautiful way. Maybe you'll see a bit of yourself in the world if you look a little closer. Amen. Amen.
things. Loving God, we thank you for every good and perfect gift that you give to us. We pray that we might have open eyes, and open ears, and open hearts, so that we might see the ways that we can serve your kingdom and your people here in this community and beyond. May you bless these gifts as you bless the hands that seek to use them in your service. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes from James 5, verses 13 to 20. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. The word of the Lord for the people of God. morning. This morning, as the scripture reading was, saying, was talking about praying for the heavens to give rain, I think there are some places in our world where people are not praying for rain, but praying for um, the blue sky. And I found a prayer that I wanted to read to you uh, regarding the devastation in, in many, in North Carolina and Burma, around the world. It's a prayer for those facing Hurricane Helene, and it's written by Mar. Let us pray together. God, your breath is always comfort. Your breath is never wind. We pray for the breath of comfort for those in Florida and Georgia who are evacuated and waiting to hear what happens to their homes, their businesses, their schools, churches, their precious members. We pray for those still in the hurry of evacuating, for those helping them, for caregivers in those in hospital and those in the care facilities, for those giving birth, those in transition times, those who are alone, feeling forgotten. We pray for those staffing shelters, for those whose work is essential, for pets lost and frightened, gardens turn up, turn torn up playgrounds destroyed, for beaches changed forever by the surge, for funerals postponed, weddings being unplanned or replanned. We pray for those cleaning up and caring for those impacted in Mexico and around the world, and for all who are even ahead of the storm's arrival, making the plans for weeks to come. Holy One, breathe on us through the wind, storm, fear, destruction, for your breath is always a comfort. 
Amen. Let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. chapter 9, verses 38 to 50. Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop, because he was not one of us. Do not stop them, Jesus said, for no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me, for whoever is not against us is for us. Truly, I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah, will certainly not lose their reward. If anyone causes these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to let enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves, and be at peace with one another. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Evan. Let's pray again. 
Loving God, may the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. In your name we pray. Amen. So I want to start out today with a little bit of a imagination game. I need each one of you to imagine that you're going to visit the doctor. So you walk in, and the doctor says what doctors normally say, which is, sorry for making you wait. <laughs> and then you sit down, and the doctor says, all right, I'm gonna give you these pills, and then we're gonna do this procedure. Now what seems to be the problem? Seems to be a little bit out of order. Doesn't it? In that mind game that I encourage you to play, the doctor was giving the treatment before giving the diagnosis. And our hope is, anytime that we go to see a doctor, we get the diagnosis first, what's wrong, and then the treatment, the way that there will hopefully be to solve whatever malady you might face. This text today is a reminder about doing things in the right order. It's a reminder that the diagnosis needs to come first. What is wrong needs to be addressed first, and then the way in which to treat that challenge, or whatever it is that might be faced. In this instance, the prognosis is good. It's life and peace with one another. But the treatment, the way to go from point A to point B, may not be as easy as the disciples hoped. I want to spend just a few moments with our gospel reading. The disciples have heard that they are called to be last of all, servant of all. That comes just a few verses earlier in Mark chapter 9. That's what Jesus instructed them. But then we hear this story about John telling them, John says, teacher, we, it's almost in a whiny voice, teacher, we saw somebody casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop them because he wasn't following us. Did you catch that? Whoever it was was casting out demons in Jesus' name, was doing the work of Jesus. But John, the other disciples, tried to stop him because he's not doing it their way. He's not one of them. He's not part of that group of people who are seen to be set apart for a certain purpose. And so they don't approve. John is blaming this other person for getting in their way. He can't see that he and the other disciples are in fact the ones who are getting in the way. I don't know if it's ever happened to you when we've gotten in the way of ourselves or someone else. But Jesus has none of it. He says, don't stop him. He says that to John and the others. Then he moves the focus from the other guy back to the disciples. He says, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. If your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. Jesus is not talking about this other guy. He's talking about his own disciples. It's as if Jesus is saying, don't you worry about that other person. Worry about yourself first. We need to diagnose that stumbling block in your life before you even think about trying to address a stumbling block in somebody else's life. And not only do we have to get the diagnosis in your life right, we have to figure out a way to treat it appropriately. And then and only then are we able to look beyond ourselves to those around us. So we ask ourselves, what does we make of this? What does it mean for your life and my life? We have this idea of stumbling blocks and amputations and tearing out eyeballs and all kinds of good and kind of gross stuff. So we have to ask ourselves, what do we do with this? What is this text saying to us in this day and age? Well, I want to go over a few things first to kind of help get the basis for what we're talking about. The first thing is that this text is not literal. Not literal, okay? I hope that we kind of gather that right from the very start. I don't see anybody here who has self-amputated their arms or their limbs or torn out one of their eyes. So my hope is 
that we recognize that though we stumble, though we fall, this is not meant to be a literal way to handle those types of situations. And if we try to take this literally, if we try to make it very simplistic for us, this is what it says, so this is what obviously we must do. I think sometimes this text and others like it lose a little bit of their credibility. It doesn't mean that we should interpret the shock and the harshness of Jesus' words any lighter, but it means that our interpretation must be looked at in this day and age and how we can take what was written then and understand it today. You see, Jesus is not trying to give a punishment to the people. He's trying to prescribe a treatment, a way to address what is wrong and find a way to manage it for them in the future. And it is a very shocking and radical way. It really gets to the core of who we are. We tend to focus on, we kind of cringe at how gross some of these words are in this prognosis on our future. But Jesus sees this as incredibly important and something that they need to address, and he has to get their attention. He has to help them to see that this is important, that he's talking about something significant. So while this text is not meant to be understood literally, it is meant to be understood seriously. Second thing, Jesus uses all kinds of very strong words that really help to identify how serious these issues are. Drowning by a millstone, amputation of a hand or a foot, tearing out of an eyeball, unquenchable fire, hell and worms that never die. This is not a children's story. This is not what Manita is covering with the kids in the back. Okay? Don't worry about that. But what we realize in this text is these are very serious, very harsh things to hear because it's important to Jesus that the disciples, all of us, at whatever point we're at, recognize that he's taking this very seriously. It's important to him. He's trying to get our attention. He's trying to wake us up. He wants us to see things in a new way as we are becoming new people, as we are being transformed into that salt that it regains its saltiness. He's showing us that there needs to be a way where we turn from ourselves into our true selves, and that while we stumble, there is a way back. So while we don't need to take these images literally, we do need to take them seriously. Jesus uses these images four times to talk about what is better for us. He, he says this directly, what is better for you is so this gospel message is not a gospel of condemnation. It's about getting better and healing. It's about facing some of those incredibly difficult truths and doing something with them. So it's not literal, but it is serious. And it's about looking at ourselves, addressing ourselves. That's the third thing I think that really strikes me about this gospel. It's about looking in. There are many times when I have stripped over my own two feet. I know that there are times when all of us have stumbled in our lives and when we fall. And I know that there are so many of those instances where when we fall, when we stumble, when we do wrong, we also bring down those around us. Those two are often related. Too often when I stumble and fall, it impacts other people. And I know that's the case for so many of us. John and the disciples have tripped over themselves before even becoming a stumbling block to somebody else. But if they continue in this vein, they're not only going to be a stumbling block for themselves, but also for the other person who they're complaining about doing Jesus' work, but maybe not the way they would do it. There's some phrases when I use stumbling block, if, if you're kind of wondering what I'm getting at, here's some other phrases that might be familiar. I'm my own worst enemy. I just shot myself in the foot. Cut off my nose to spite my face. Doing the same old thing and hoping that there's going to be a different outcome. There are times in our own lives when we can address ourselves being a stumbling block for our own progress. Instances where things that we have said, we have done, things we have thought, have been a, uh, tripped us up in our own lives and either hurt just us 
or hurt those people around us. But Jesus uses metaphors for stumbling block in today's gospel. He uses the idea of hands and feet and eyes. The thing that have become the stumbling block are intended to be things that are instead building blocks, the basis upon which good can happen. But Jesus is saying by the things that we are saying and doing, we're in fact holding ourselves back. So think about it this way. Hands. Hands can be used to mold and, and create life, to welcome, to embrace, to, to reach out, to create, to care for one another. Hands can be healing. They can be a symbol of action. Whenever you have mishandled a relationship or situation, whenever we have held the wrong ideas or allegiances, all of these types of things, hands can be good, but they can also be the things of violence, the things of hurt. Open hands, receptive hands, or closed hands, which become fists, things that can be good, can also cause us to stumble. Feet. Feet are things that can move us through life. Tell them move us to new places, to meet new people, new ideas, new experiences. They can be the kinds of things that are good, but they can also be the same kind of things that trip somebody up, kick somebody, metaphorically or literally. You ever tripped over your own two feet? When I was a child, I have to tell my mom I told this story sometime. When I was a child, um, my parents could never put me in sandals. Never could wear sandals. Because I would be running with great enthusiasm and excitement from point A to point B, and inevitably I would catch a sandal and wham, right on my face. Every single time. To the point where, even as an adult, if I showed up at my parents' house wearing sandals, before my father's passing, he would say, are you sure you want to wear those in public? Because he says, we remember what happened. So you've got this enthusiastic kid who then ultimately trips over his own two feet. Where have you gone where you have fallen short? To the places that are not good for you. Where have you stepped on or kicked or hindered somebody else? And where have you used those feet to walk away from those in need? Last example. Our eyes. Our eyes can be things that see beauty and wisdom and goodness and holiness in each other and in other people. They're meant to look out, to see things before us, things of beauty, things of hopefulness. But they can also be impaired. They can also be things that cause us to stumble, to walk in the dark, to not see things that were right before us, to misperceive things, to make wrong judgments based on partial truths. Where have we looked at others with anger and jealousy and hatred and hurt? Hands, feet, eyes, all of them are good but they can all cause us to stumble. So where are we allowing these things to cause us to stumble in this day and age? You see, answering these questions is not for condemnation purposes, but for diagnosis purposes. Because once we diagnose those places where our hands and our feet and our eyes cause us to stumble, then and only then can we look to the treatment. Just like the doctor has to be a diagnosis first followed by a treatment. And I think for the disciples, they want to be good. They want to be right. They want to be um, fulfilling goodness in their lives. And I think the fact is, so do each of us. At our core, no matter what journey we might be on in our faith, we want to be in the right direction. We want to be those people of love and hope. And I want us to see that we are goodness because God his goodness to us. So if we truly want to be better, and if we're willing to do that work to diagnose the places that are stumbling in our own lives, being able to do that hard work, I think that allows us then to have that diagnosis that can then create a good prescription. Jesus prescribes, again, metaphorically speaking, not literally, cutting off and tearing out. And I think that's a pretty extreme example. But it's interesting, because for Jesus, that idea of the amputation is necessary to become whole. Think about that. For him to be whole, one must remove something that is holding them back. 
has to separate in order to be full. See, the gospel is not about good and bad. It's a gospel of hope, healing, and wholeness. And sometimes it requires us to leave behind those things that inhibit us in order to be free for the things that lay before us. So I wonder, what does Jesus' prescription look like in our lives today? What do we need to let go of? What do we need to be free of? What do we need to put aside so that we might be able to then take on the goodness that God wants for each of us? What are the things we need to walk away from? What places do we need to avoid? What do we need to close our eyes to so that our eyes are not affixed at bad, but it can be affixed on good? What are those things distorting our vision and turning us away? Because again, I think we are here because we want wholeness. But we need to do the diagnosis first so that we might be able to receive the prescription to find the fullness of health. My hope for each and every one of us this week is that we can do some of that hard work, and it is hard work. Because if you think the disciples liked being told, hey, don't look at that other guy first, look at yourself, that probably made them very, very, very uncomfortable. And it can do the same for us. But I encourage you to look at your own lives. Identify some of those stumbling blocks. Recognize how important it is to address those stumbling blocks so that you might be able to be free to move forward and to see all that God has in store for each one of you. Diagnosis, prescription, wholeness. May God bless us as we seek to diagnose. May we see what God has before us and may we move into that direction of individual healing and wholeness for the sake of God. Amen. Let's sing together, though I'm going to check my order of service, just to make sure everything's, <coughs> I have what you have. Let's sing together, God of grace and God of glory. <laughs>
maker of heaven and earth. Our help leads us forth to bring peace and love to the earth. Our help goes with us to protect us and to guide our way. Amen and amen. Let's sing together our sun blessing and amen. Go to the world.